Hello and welcome to Roadmap 2023, our election issues and personalities tracking program. I am Ladi Akiri Dunwale. Thanks for joining us. My guest on today's edition says politicians are keeping most of their financial resources with the expressed intention to buy votes on election day instead of publicizing what they intend to do for the electorate via the traditional adverts and infomercial productions platforms. My guest also says less than 4% of those contesting the election will be women, a sad reflection on the level of inclusivity in the nation's political system. Roadmap 2023 talks to the executive director of the Center for Democracy and Development, Idayat Hassan. Idayat Hassan, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Ladi. You raised uh, a bit of an alarm, shall I say, when you said that the insecurity that would attend the 2023 election would be, to use your word, unprecedented. Now, many people know that, you know, there is insecurity, but what exactly did you mean when you said it would be unprecedented or that it was unprecedented? I think it's important to point out that, yes, while Nigeria has actually battled insecurity, what we are facing currently, which I continue to call an epidemic of insecurity, is unprecedented in all of the country's four republics. And in this instance, you are talking about raging conflict in the southeast of the country. By, this, by that, we mean the separationist agitation, which of course has taken different forms with different groups, three different groups emerging out of the indigenous people of Biafra. At a point, they have actually affected the elections right from the voters' registration exercise, where instead of working for five days in a week, INEC had to work for four days in a week. You will find that out of all the attacks on INEC infrastructure, the highest number 11 representing like 20% has been just from Imo State, as well as what the non-state actors like Ibubiagu uh, and Co are also doing in that region. And that is just a microsome of the Southeast. In the same vein, you go to the south-south of the country. While we think that the, uh, the militancy has actually helped a bit, there has been a rise of cultism in that area, and you even see nothing brings home how dangerous it is more than the uh, abduction of over 30 people in the train in a do state just a few days ago. That is south-south that looks actually better and more progressive. You go to the northwest, you have more than 100 bandit groups operating in that region, with each having a minimum of like 30 members in the group, minus the activities of the insurgents, the jihadists that have moved away from the northeast into the northwest of the country in such a way that you have the Ansaru, you have the Islamic State in the West African province, Iswap, and the Boko Haram elements now operating in the northwest of the country up to the north central, part of the north central, such as Niger and even moving into Kwara. And we still have the insurgency, which of course is become more latent, it's not as potent as it used to be in the northeast of the country. This is minus farmers and headers conflict, and political violence itself seems to have actually been at one of the highest, with our Nigerian election tracker done in partnership with ACLID just by the end of December, recording more than 120 just of cultist attacks. That is minus other forms of attacks that you might actually be thinking of. And it is within this framework that INEC will actually be conducting elections. So you have the challenges of prevailing insecurity, which far outweighs what we experienced in the 2015 elections when we said that Boko Haram had taken over just the size of, about the size of Belgium in the, north, um, in the northeastern part of the country. Everywhere you look, there are challenges. These are serious implications for the ability of voters to assess the polls, for even the election management bodies to recruit uh, workers. And uh, beyond that, it also raises the cost of movement 
of materials for elections, aside from the safety of election officials and election materials. And it has a huge implication, which we are not even talking about. In the case of a very disrupted polls on elections day, the ability to accept a win comes into, becomes a challenge, as well as the ability to even call the win in instances where elections are very uh, widely disrupted. So this 25% spread we have been talking about and we have been focusing largely on the ability of the parties, the candidates, to actually get that 25% spread is just small because even the ability to determine it might come into question if security is not immediately restored across the country. Now, there, there are several things you've raised in that, uh, in, in, in that response, and uh, I want to like, take them one after the other and bit by bit so that uh, the viewers can actually assimilate. Uh, when you talk about the elections themselves, uh, broadly speaking, there are two parts of it. There's the election management body and its activities on one side. Then you have the electorate and the politicians, the contestants on the other side. Now, it is the combination of both that brings about the election that could be described as fair, free, and credible, uh, and having integrity and all of that. Now, from the side of the election management body, apart from the security challenges which you've enumerated, attacks on the offices and so on, there seems to have also been introduced now some element of credibility uh, uh, with one or two of the parties uh, saying that they are not 100% sure that INEC can be completely trusted uh, with the process. You and I, of course, would both have heard uh, that there was an attempt, allegedly, uh, by one of the security agencies to effect the arrest of the INEC chairman uh, a little while ago over the issue of falsification of uh, assets, alleged falsification of assets. So again, does this all not come together to speak about uh, on one side, the problem that the election management body will have with the election itself, given this kind of background. Yeah, I think that it's, it's a very important one because it's also telling us that election is a process. It's not a one-day event. So if they attempt to actually intimidate the management of the head of the election management bodies, it raises a lot of questions. And this is nothing new. In Nigeria's elections, you may recollect in 2015, um, prior to the elections, they started talking about a Jega must proceed on terminal leave, that he must proceed on terminal leave and he should not be the one to run the elections. In 2019, we saw how the same use of the code of conduct uh, refused to, uh, to properly declare, declare assets, assets was used to remove the then CJN of the country. So it's just telling us that election is very zero-sum and actors will do anything to undermine the process. So see, insecurity is just one part of it, but undermining the process and even trying to kind of thwart the citizens' trust in this electoral process is what we are seeing that will be happening. And once the chairman is removed, anyway, they've come to assure us that that will not happen the credibility of the old election is almost taken away because you bring in a last person and it's not even done in international best practices. Like that would amount to an anomaly. The first own goal for, a, for this APC government, if such is actually done. Now, uh, one of the things that seem to have engendered a great deal of trust uh, uh, if you want to call it that, in this particular process is the introduction of technology, things like the beavers and all of that uh, to enhance uh, the capacity of those who will vote and for those who are monitoring the process to be able to say, okay, this is an actual voter. This card did not come from someone who is trying to use the process uh, for his or her own advantage. Now, from what you have seen so far, do you think that introduction of technology uh, and all the things that have happened thereafter, including the controversy about the number of beavers and uh, how widespread uh, uh, their distribution and use will be and so on, uh, supports the view that this technology's introduction has in fact enhanced the process? I think so far so good the beavers and the IREV have actually enhanced the process. When you look at the off-circle elections in 
Kogi, ah no, the off circle elections in Ekiti and Oshun itself, we saw an improvement compared to the previous elections, and this has helped to actually um, imbue more trust in the process, particularly in the heart of young people. So all over, people are beginning to feel that their vote will count uh, itself. But while technology is, an, is, is a positive, it's not a silver bullet. So managing expectations also becomes very, very important and relevant. While it worked perfectly well in these two off-circle elections, you have to understand that it represents just like 3.5%. Max just put it approximately like 4% of the total number of polling units and local government, we will actually be having elections in this, in 20, during the general elections. So it raises the question that if this technology must work perfectly, the training of the staff that will be utilizing it must be top notch. The numbers that must also be available must be more than what it's currently, so let's say currently we have like 14,000 extra. I, that should at least be increased by two because we have seen it. If you look at Kenyan elections, they had the Kim's kit, which is a direct replica of our beavers. And for every word, we were made to understand or we saw that there were at least six extra in this area. So we need more of the beavers. We also need the ability to have trained people properly so that they can properly utilize these beavers because this is the first time it is being utilized on a national scale and at such numbers uh, that we have not seen uh, previously. So there are really issues, but it is a positive because with the beavers and the IRIF, everybody wants to participate in the elections, but much work needs to be done before the election day itself. Now, I want to link what you've just said now with something you said a bit earlier, which is when you talked about the security and the implications, where you mentioned 25% and constitutional provisions and all of that to determine a winner and, all, and, and, and so on. Now, when we bring the two together, the security concerns and the concerns over the use of the technology, uh, again, that brings to bear some level of cloud over the issue of how credible, how legal the process will be. Because already we have been told that uh, in areas where the beavers po possibly do not function or, uh, or do not get to and so on, there are provisions uh, uh, in the 2022 Electoral Act that indicate, and going by INEX guidelines, that if that proves to be the case, uh, elections in, in some of those areas may in fact not take place. Uh, since there is no provision for a backup like the incidence forms that we had before. Doesn't that impinge also on what you described earlier as some of the difficulty that comes from uh, uh, elections not holding in particular places and the integrity of the entire process? I think in, in situations where the beavers malfunction and it's not, been able, it's not immediately replaced, elections will hold the following day. Uh, according to a high net. But that itself, while you say election will hold the following day, it will need a lot of voter education for people to understand that. Because it will be extremely difficult to actually go to the polling unit. You just have couples of copper, like four people, then the beavers malfunction. The people are not acquiesced of the procedure that election can continue the following day if there is a malfunctioning. And you have a a sea of people like 300, 200, even 100. How to explain that might actually be a challenge. It might be a challenge. And these are things that we really need to guide against. And this is why I keep saying that much work actually needs to be done so people can understand the provision of the law and how to utilize this provision of the law. And it's also important that most of the political parties currently do not understand the provision of the Electoral Act 2022 adequately. So unless they understand these provisions themselves, planning and informing the people might actually be very difficult and it might become extremely contested during polls. You, you are speaking to me today from Meiduguri, the Borno State Capital. 
And that is one of the areas where security has proven to be a challenge, both in past elections and there are those who are saying it will be even in the coming uh, election. The governor, Babagana Zulum, says that the state is 90% safe. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm taking him at his word, and therefore I want to ask you about the other 10%. And you are in an especially good position because I know that you have done work uh, uh, in this area over the last couple of years. You've been actively involved in the safe corridor establishment in taking a look at research about how Boko Haram emerged and all of that. So I want to ask, that 10% that the governor admits is probably not safe, will we not have the same problem if the people who are in that 10% are not able to exercise their franchise or if INEC is not able to deploy to, that, uh, to those areas to, to vote? I think for Bono, compared to previous elections, there has been an improved um, security environment. So out of the 27 local government, you can say people have been returned to 26 with the exception, exception of Guzamala uh, local government in the state. And it, there is a very huge likelihood that elections will take place across here because people are even farming. It's the timing that really matters. Maybe now people rush to farm between 9 and 2 and they go back to their home. So ability for elections to take place is there. But also in the INEC uh, guidelines and by virtue of the new electoral act, you find that there is a section 24 that allows for IDP voting. So in situations like this, particularly in Bonu, where there are still few established IDP camps, people will have access to vote in those areas. But I underline one thing, in all elections in Bonu Yobe, uh, Bonu Yobe in particular, on election day, there are always, maybe at the beginning of the election, a bit of skirmish in terms of um, you find a Boko Haram attack at the beginning of the day or during the midnight, then you find that election will hold as possible. Uh, will go on as, as planned. And this time around, these people have even been moved to the fringes of the Lake Chad basis, Basin. And like I earlier mentioned, some have even moved to the northwest of the country. So while Bornu continues to remain, which is Bornu is like the epicenter, with Adamara, if you read our, our first report by September, and we were talking in terms of a SWOT and the presidential polls, a SWOT Indeed. analysis, our mapping of, of, of conflict then showed that there were just two attacks. And most of the attacks, even in this order, that was in Adamawa, so you can see there is a normalcy that is gradually returning. So there is a movement. It's not perfect, but as usual, I think they've become adaptable to running elections in this contest for, uh, for, this, uh, for Borneo State, Yobe uh, in particular. Let me, let me uh, leave security for a moment and go to the issue of the, uh, the mechanisms for the election themselves. Uh, one of the most important, if not the most important, uh, is the voters' register and people's collection of the permanent voters' card, uh, which is another instrument by which you exercise your franchise. Let me talk about the voters' register. Um, as, as we speak, INEC has just... Uh, extended the PVC collection until the end of January uh, because there were so many complaints uh, from people that they were not able to access the areas or the centers where they were supposed to make the collection. But before I come to that, let's talk first about the voters' register. Are you better satisfied with this one that is said to have 93.4 million uh, Nigerians who will vote next month? I think so far so good. The voter registra uh, registration exercise and the verification has seen an improvement. One, the improvement, it does not just come from HINEC. We are not talking about HINEC. We are talking of citizenry taking it upon themselves to actually identify all those underage voters, dead people in the voters' register. In previous elections, we've not seen this kind of activity. We saw press conferences, we saw people on Twitter, and people even wrote petition to raise these issues. So taking it a notch forward, we now determine on us going back to check how many of those faces have actually been removed from, this, uh, from the voters' register. So the credibility seems at least improved uh, with the participation 
of the citizens uh, in this uh, process. That means that, of course, uh, naturally, the PVCs which are being produced now also have integrity because if a great deal of weeding out of dead names, underage names, and so on, are taking place on the register, then the PVCs that are being produced now and the people that are going to collect them are actual voters. Yes, exactly. We, will, we hope uh, and believe that they would actually be act actual voters. But one thing that is rarely even discussed is the fact that most of those faces, those names that we see on those uh, voters' registers that have been disputed did not just come into being in the 2022 uh, registration exercise. Some of them have been there as far as 2011, 2011 registration, because it's a composite, it's a complete, uh, it's a complete process. But with, the, with what INEC said, that people will be held to account at the polling unit, the stakes also are very high in these elections, that people in many parts of the country will not be allowing underage or people using, or and the introduction of the BVAS, of course, which authenticates with no incident from either your fingerprints or your other biometrics, like your eyes, at least that cannot change uh, in spite <laughs> of anything uh, that you can think of, has kind of improved the process if properly managed. In that, in that scenario, let me bring you to something else, which you alluded to a little bit earlier when you said the stakes are very high. And because the stakes are very high, they seem, you know, that it's, it, the stakes are very high virtually in every election in Nigeria. But they are particularly high in this election because, once again, we are going to go through a transition regardless of whoever it is that emerges uh, as the president and in many of the states. So I want to ask the question, is the situation better now with the phenomenon of vote buying and selling, which we witnessed even in the off-season elections, in uh, uh, Ekiti and in Oshun, uh, and of course in the 2015 electoral process. Are we better off today than we were then? No way. No way, laddie. The stakes are higher in these elections, which one point we even rarely talk about before I speak about the vote buying and selling. One is that since the 1979 elections, we have not had formidable candidates from the three frontline ethnic groups except in these elections that we are having. So you have Hausa Ibo, you have Yoruba or Hausa Fulani, and you have Yoruba. So this has further heightened the stakes along the ethnic line. And one of the ways to win these elections will actually be to buy votes. Even check on, on media across. Previously, by now there will be adverts, like series and series and series of adverts on radio, on TV station, like 40... 43 days or so to the elections, how many of such adverts are you finding? People are keeping their money to buy votes in this election. So what we will witness, what we have witnessed with the Oshun elections, with votes in some polling units going for as much as 20,000, will actually be higher in these elections where money will be playing a lot of role. So it seems people are just keeping the money and waiting till the last minute to buy the vote. But here it is actually a market because it's not just somebody that is trying to uh, forcing people to sell their votes. People are also willingly coming forward to say that we will not vote if our votes are not bought. The only thing is that with the young people, with the kind of, with the way they are galvanizing themselves to take part in these elections, uh, it might have, it will still count, it will still decide. But we will still have some very good and positive case study to see that in certain areas, people rejected vote, uh, money and decided to vote their own way, which are positives we often look at, look for during elections. Now, you are a lawyer, so I want, I want to like, take this from the legal prism. I, I understand what you've just said and, and, and how, I mean, that is perhaps the realistic viewpoint. But... In, 20, in, in the off-season elections in AKT and Oshun, there were quite a number of people who were caught uh, by the security agencies, the EFCC and I think the police, uh, for vote buying in particular. 
uh, uh, even though I'm not too sure of how many were caught for selling their votes, but several were caught for, buy, for attempting to buy or for buying votes. And the evidence was displayed. There were, there were registers where people's names and PVC numbers were written uh, you know, to explain the accountability process of how the money was distributed. But we haven't heard anything about their prosecution or, 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 or successful indictment for those crimes. And yet we are at another election uh, process. So what is there to deter new people from participating? Which brings up the question that some people in your uh, fraternity, the uh, uh, CSOs, NGOs, and observer fraternity have said, Nigeria needs an electoral offenses commission or tribunal, special courts to try these kind of matters so that they don't fester. Do you agree? It's true. I do agree completely. We can only say that for the first time, we've also seen uh, somebody prosecuted in Gombe during the successful prosecution in Gombe State from the 2019 elections. And currently, the people caught in Oshun are facing, um, are facing um, the, trial? the court. EFCC is prosecuting for the first, yes, they are facing trial for the first time. EFCC is actually pursuing prosecution in this case. And what has also happened is that alongside INEC, EFCC, ICPC, um, and APCON and Co, they formed, they formed the kind of compact to deal with the issue of money in these elections. And in 20, at the end of uh, December, I think December 19th, 2022, they had a meeting where they tried to formalize this. CDD actually supported them in that venture. And we are working assiduously to see that in these elections, these people are able to work together. But the best would have actually been having this electoral offenses commission because it means that it will allow for like some very trial of some of these cases that we are talking about. The problem with Nigeria in almost everything is this impunity, where there is a lack of accountability. People are never brought to account. So people will be planning and be like, okay, it is written in the electoral heart that this is an offense. In Estan's provision, it is already available that it is already provided for that there are punishments for him to induce voters, really. But when you do not even have people being brought to book or you have the small fishes being brought to book, it will continue. So the best that could have happened is that this Electoral Offenses Commission will be a platform utilized for these 2023 elections. But it's already a lost opportunity, and I think it's one advocacy that we will have to take forward after the 2023 election. And then that brings me to the 2022 Electoral Act itself, that uh, what has been described as omnibus legislation created by the National Assembly and assented to by the president uh, to govern, guide, uh, you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, enable the electoral process going forward. We have had changes to the Electoral Act uh, uh, right from 1999, uh, but um, this 2022 Electoral Act is said to be quite elaborate. But then, like every other law, there are significant loopholes. Uh, uh, and then, uh, because those who promulgated it or who put it together were also politicians, uh, they tended to, in the course of you know, putting their political interests uh, to the document, uh, seem to have shot the country in the foot uh, 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 as part of it, as evidenced by what is there. This is not my view. This is what is evidenced in the media and, and from the views of people like you. So on the overall, is this 2022 Electoral Act a good document with which to guide an election that has so much at stake like this one? Yes, I think this is like the most progressive electoral heart that we have had, uh, especially after the 2010 electoral heart, which was severally amended. This electoral heart is progressive, even with the way it changed the nature of politics itself. In previous elections, you rather see campaign. You see how ahead of the primaries, how people were forced to crisscross across the nation are uh, speaking to people, trying to woo delegates that will actually vote for them. And we saw how the, uh, the primaries went, irrespective of some of the challenges. But it has made election management also become very, very easier. 
I, if I take one positive that I look forward to observing in the 2023 elections, it will be the ability to change results, that this power that has now been granted to Heineck. In the previous past, when people give, make wrong declaration, it will have to go to court before that can be addressed. We saw in Imo, in Rivers, where people came forward to say that they were forced to make declaration under duress. The electoral management body at that point was just like a toothless bulldog. With this act, this is really a positive. It's also allowed for the technology which everybody is really excited about now, giving INEC the right to determine even the mode of the transmission of results, the ability to use technological devices and innovation, which was not previously obtainable while we were using the smart card readers itself. So there are lots and lots and lots, lots of innovation that has come into this electoral act and which are commendable, which will depend now on the ability to apply it during the, the forthcoming elections. But it's really a positive. It is a positive. It's one of the best things. Having this brand new uh, electoral act itself is setting the tone for what will likely be an improved elections where people will believe that their vote is actually counting. Uh, most probably, we see their vote count or we feel a part and parcel of the process. You mentioned something earlier on in the interview when you said that it would be the first time in probably since 1979, uh, which is a very, very long time ago, that the electoral process will have candidates uh, from uh, the, the three major uh, ethnic groups in the country. And that that puts the stake high in a country uh, that is known for its ethnic uh, uh, cleavages. So I, I want to ask you this. Uh, one of the ways that uh, people have sought to muddy the waters, if you like, is through the use of uh, social media uh, to disseminate what is now popularly known as fake news uh, uh, unverified stories to uh, further incite uh, people one way or the other. We've seen it in other countries, but you have done quite a bit of work on this vis-a-vis uh, -vis Nigeria. What have you found, uh, uh, especially in this particular process, ahead of this election? It's been an interesting one. I think this is quite interesting compared to the 2023, uh, the 2019 elections. You find that from the beginning of the whole electoral process, people were not even concerned about co forming their campaign committee. The first thing they did was to look at who their spokesperson is, who will direct their digital media while working on other issues, which tells you how much, um, how much emphasis is actually being placed on the role of media and in particular social media in these elections. In fact, speaking to many of the people, uh, these uh, influencers or actors ahead of these elections, in fact, from Kano to Lagos, Abuja, we have been conducting interviews ahead of these elections. People have just been talking about, for the first time, politicians are recognizing the important role the social media can actually play in these in elections and they are not taking it for granted. And they are doing quite a lot of things with it. One in several instances, some are using it to glorify their candidates. They are using it to tell the stories, write copies, write things of how good their candidate is, how he is the best person, the best thing that has actually happened to the country. Even ascribing achievements that are not co correct to this candidate. So, I, um, so glorifying their candidate might be the least arm um, that is actually being done. But it's also being used to delegitimize processes, delegitimize candidates. Some candidates are going to lose a lot of votes in these elections, not because necessarily, yes, they might be challenged, but the role social media is actually being played to showcase them as very bad people or people who cannot, uh, it will do have impact on their votes in these elections because one thing with social media in Nigeria is that there is a bloodline between the online and the offline. What is said online, find a way to get into the offline spaces, either by people sharing phone or using a phone as what we call the pavement radio or the soldiers of mouth who goes from houses uh, to house, house to house, 
sharing some of this information itself. And when you look at it, it's being used to discredit institutions, particularly the election management body, um, the election management body aside the candidates. So you see some processes. There is no perfect process, and some are really challenged. Maybe they are not even doing well enough. But it might be used to, it's being used to even aggravate some instances, and it will play a very huge role on the day of elections by the time we start talking about declaration of results uh, what happens. It's being used to divide people along ethnic lines itself because there are close spaces by the time we start talking about the kind of platforms that are being used. So if you take Facebook for instance, Facebook allows for close spaces where you can talk in your ethnic group, when you can talk in your age group or you can talk in your professional group and nobody can actually have access to what you talk about in this um, forum. Uh, WhatsApp in these elections is basically being used as a platform to organize by the actors itself, while, of course, Twitter is one of the most ins insidious platforms with TikTok carrying the day. So I call it a TikTok election because more and more, TikTok is not just being used to run jingles or adverts. It's also used for the challenges. So when one party uses it to bolster a candidate, another one uses it to actually delegitimize uh, the candidate at the same time. So it's being used to divide us. It's being used to divide us more than we really have. It's being used to uh, spread fear. And in previous elections, we've seen it used to suppress voters. When people start posting pictures of violence, in a particular, in the opposition stronghold, like we saw it in Kano during the um, supplementary elections. And, of course, people saw violence. Yes, there were violence. While we checked the violence, out of more than 33 pictures, it was only four of those pictures that were authentic, really. But these, these pictures were instrumentalized in particular areas where people felt that, look, it's so violent, it's better for us to actually sit at home. And if this rerun or this, um, this likelihood of a runoff that is already being touted happens, this, the, this information will play a very huge role because voters will be confused about this particular candidate or the other that has actually allied with another candidate. So it's going to play a lot of role on ahead of the elections and particularly on the day of elections and post-elections. And it has a likelihood of actually being responsible for any form of post-election violence that we may experience. Now, I, I, I must also ask you about uh, the politics, if you like, of inclusivity, uh, 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 because that's another battle that has been ongoing. When the not too young uh, to run act was passed. Uh, there were many people who said hallelujah uh, because it, it was a framework that provided uh, for the young to get into the uh, political process, both as uh, contestants uh, as, uh, and as voters, uh, as active players, uh, if you like. But um, that was ahead of the 2019 elections, almost four years or thereabouts uh, uh, going forward. Uh, some have expressed disappointment. Are you disappointed at the results? Are you disappointed at the results that we have seen uh, from the efforts that have come under this new act? Yeah, I think like, yes, it's a, the act was a positive, but the, it is not immediately able to achieve what we expect from it. And that is why maybe it would have been better if it has been married alongside a quota system. Because ours is a very is a winner-take-all uh, politics. And here the raw money is actually being, the raw money is being used to disenfranchise young people and women from participating in elections play a very huge role in their inability. So the problem is ability to access ballots. Because to be on the ballot, you must actually have had all the money and you would have used all the money to get uh, in the, during the party primaries to emerge as a candidate. Aside from the role, culture, of course, place, religion has barriers. But money is one of the most 
the huge barrier to access the ballot in Nigeria to win in particular. What we have found is that it's not like people do not want to vote for young people. It's because they are not on the ballot in the first instance, but it's because they also do not have the money. And when they go to the smaller parties, because the smaller parties do not have the structure, it becomes extremely difficult for them to win. Because getting on the two major parties' platform, and now thankfully the NNPP and the LP will add value, it's, it's almost like, where will you get your supporters? Do people identify the, the logos of this party? Uh, do they know them? Where will you have the money or the materials, the facilities, the down ballots that can actually assist you to reach voters so they know you and they vote for you? So it's, it's really the problem. And getting on the, lower, the smaller parties actually disadvantages them at the end of the day. Indeed. Uh, the other uh, non-included group would be women. Um, in the, with, with, with the, there were those who have been tracking this, and I know you are one of them, uh, from 1999 going forward, and one would have expected that you know, there are incrementals uh, uh, every election circle. Uh, but ahead of 20, the 2023 election, it doesn't look like much progress has been made. Uh, women, uh, there's only one uh, 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 female governorship yes. aspirant uh, that I'm aware, uh, sorry, candidate that I'm aware of from, uh, from the major political parties, the four you mentioned earlier. There's only one uh, at the level of, uh, uh, of the president. There's also just one female presidential candidate. Uh, that I'm aware of, of the 18 that are contesting the election. Uh, and then, of course, if you go further down the slate, you'll find that women are a very small percentage. Uh, is it also these same factors you've just enumerated that have kept them away, or is it, are there other things? Because there will be those who have argued that, well, women now have a more level playing field. Uh, in many of the parties, uh, they don't pay nomination fees. Uh, in many of the parties... Uh, they have positions that are kept for them, even within the party and all of that. I think like this 2023 elections has disadvantaged women the more. I, the next week we are releasing a report and uh, the, the so-called, the number of candidates even vying is going to be around 4% compared to previous elections. And when you contrast this, you find that how many will be in the National Assembly, for instance? You are going to have a lower number than the above like six percent we had in this night national assembly so there are real challenges that we really have to deal with but aside the the role of money culture and also contributes to restrain women from participating uh in politics while the fear of violence is also a, a challenge and now it, the, the new challenge we are now beginning to have is gendered disinformation which is like a gendered fake news where people will peddle rumor people will show nude pictures of some of these candidates themselves they will make them feel that they are less than a man in the elections so this itself is actually preventing them from participating in elections so these are real challenges that women actually grapple with and the fact that they do not even have the watches to vie in elections is a very, very big factor. They do not have the watchers. Say the only female candidate on the platform of APC, yes, she's currently back on the ballot, but she is still in court itself. So this winner takes all attitude. This belief that, okay, why should it be a woman? What, are, what is their capacity to actually lead itself? The fact that people even ingrain it in their children, that why vote for a woman? Uh, why vote for a woman, or even the renewed fear that the more role and position you give women, the more you are trying to uh, remove yourself from the political scene has also become real of recent. One of the things that seems to have come to light in all of this is that, uh, and there are some who have made the argument that uh, perhaps we are expecting too much too soon from uh, Nigeria's uh, democratic process because uh, that basically uh, our societies within Nigeria are not uh, 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 democratic by nature in many parts of the country and that uh, democracy is a new concept uh, that had been introduced uh, because mostly uh, it was a top-down approach 
I, I, I remember uh, reading uh, in, uh, somewhere that in an interview you granted, I think in 2018, you did say that in your home, uh, you voted about everything. Uh, uh, but that would be an unusual system in, in, in Nigeria. In most homes, the parents gave the law, the children had no option but to obey. Uh, do you think that has had some impact on the way that people have grown to understand democracy and the issues of choice and how those choices are arrived at uh, and that that is in itself playing a role in the lack of internal democracy in the political parties, uh, in the winner-take-all that you talked about earlier, uh, the lack of inclusivity of women and uh, young people and all of that in the entire process. Is it that, you know, we, are, we have started it wrong and therefore we cannot expect that we would get a good result uh, at the end of the pipeline? I think Nigeria has always been democratic. Even when you go to the pre-colonial era, there were democracies. They, were, they might be like monarchical system, but they were democratic in nature. If they weren't democratic in nature, people will not talk about their laughing system when they say you open the calabash when they are, and their laughing uh, will be removed. You wouldn't talk about the role the Humwada will play in the colonial um, southeastern Nigeria. You wouldn't talk about the Queen Aisha um, in Zao Zao and all these big people even in Sokoto today that they were riding horses and they were going to war like that. It was inclusive. But I think uh, the more we grew, in fact, I think in the last couple of years, we have ceased to be as inclusive as we used to be because people are like vying for power. And you can't vie for power by living on the current voters register, we are talking about 47.5% of the registered voters being women uh, of a total population. So you talk about 48% and they are not included in the old governance um, architecture. So who are you making law for? You can't make law for people without understanding how they feel. And you can't talk about the fact that these women are not also capable itself. It's just the nature of politics. It's people instrumentalizing money, instrumentalizing religion, instrumentalizing culture to make things look different because they do want to be in charge. And you find that play in the different electoral geography of this country. In some parts of the country, women do not decide who they vote for. They are actually chosen, so a chosen candidate. So their vote is almost like no choice. They just tell them, just go to the poll. This is who we are going to vote for. And that is how it actually is done at the end of the day. But it, it's not really about democracy. Because when you look at Rwanda, when you look at Kenya, they all made a conscious effort to put in place a quota system. You see the same in Senegal. And the women are so active. In fact, if I take Senegal as an example, we don't host a meeting in Senegal without bringing the women league uh, in the parliament. They have to be present for your meeting to be adjudged successful. In fact, you have to ensure that you create position for them while you are hosting any meeting in Dhaka or any part of Senegal. It needs cautious effort. And that is exactly what we are not making or ready to make in this country. So we just have to be optimistic because we have no Nigeria. This is just our country and it's a stakeholders affair and we must do our part. In fact, if we are able to do like our own part in these elections, it will be successful, it will be credible and it will reflect our will. Indeed, that's a very uh, uh, positive uh, and a good way to end the interview. I want to thank you very much, Idad Hassan, uh, Executive Director of the CDD, for your time on the program from our Maiduguri Studios. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ladin. That's our program today. We would, of course, like to hear from you on the conversation. Our social media handles are right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of the program via our podcast. Please visit our website, channelstv.com, to get started. I am Ladi Akiri Dunwale. Goodbye.